Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all you who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards. Weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines, ruined my fig tree, stripped off their bark, thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed. New wine is dried up, oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, the fig tree is withered, pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down. The grain is dried up. How the cattle moan. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the open pastures and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you and streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the open pastures. Oh, Lord, we ask, please, help us make sense of a passage that doesn't seem comforting, it doesn't seem encouraging, it doesn't even seem comprehensible. So we ask that you take this and help me as I share the message I feel you have put on my heart, Lord, Put a guard over my lips. Don't let me say anything that's not true, that's not from you. But help me help these people make sense out of your word. Lord, we believe you're speaking tonight, that you've called us together to hear a word from you. So like little Samuel, speak, Lord. We're listening. So Holy Spirit, speak to us, we pray. And we give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you're um, a fan of NCAA basketball, you know when the season ends, right? I know Sylvia Hatchell knows when the season ends. Our precious friend, head coach of the women's Lady Tar Heels at the University of North Carolina, and um, maybe I'll talk about her tomorrow. Maybe we'll, anyway, fabulous, and she's come to share this weekend with us. She knows when the season ends. It's March Madness, right? And everybody knows when NCAA basketball ends, at least in North Carolina you do. <laughs> and if you're a parent, you know when the school year ends, right? Because then you've got to plan camp, summer vacation, so you're already calculating that, I would expect. And if you're like me and I'm responsible for a lot of the business in my family now, I know when the fiscal year ends and I know April 15th I've got to get all my stuff, you know, turned in so that we pay our taxes. And you know when the seminar ends because you're going to have to check out of your room and you're going to have to pack up your bag and go home. So we know when things end because we need to know because it helps us plan what we're going to be doing, where we're going to be going, you know, what our priorities are going to be. And if we know the end of those things and we spend time thinking about it, arranging for it, preparing for it, how much more important is it to know the end of human history and where we might be in relation to it? Matthew 24, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came up to him and they asked him this question, Jesus, tell us how we'll know the end of human history. 
What are the signs of the end of the age? And we're going to talk about that on Sunday morning, but what I want to pull out and emphasize is that Jesus did not dispute with them about whether or not there would be an end of the age. <laughs> there will be an end. And the evolutionist would tell us that, you know, we've been here for billions of years, and we're going to go on for billions of years, and it's just, you know, we're evolving into whatever, and that is such a lie. They tell us we've come from nothing, we're going nowhere, we're accountable to no one. And it's in a direct contradiction to God's word. Because God's word tells us that human history had a beginning when God created the heavens and the earth and then he created man from the dust of the ground and he breathed his own life into Adam and he became a living being and he created Eve and that's where human history began. And human history has a midpoint. And it doesn't mean that history is equally divided in half, two equal halves, just there's a point on which all of human history pivots, and it's the first coming of Jesus. His birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, that's the middle, that's the midpoint of, of human history. And human history, just as it had a begin, beginning, just as it has a midpoint, it will have an end. And it ends, as Joel has pointed out, in the spectacular, great and terrible day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ comes back visibly, physically, to the Mount of Olives to reign and rule this world from the city of Jerusalem. Praise God. There is an end to human history, and it's ending in Jesus. You can read the book of Revelation, which is one of my favorite books, and you can read the end of the story, and it's all about Jesus. And he will be exalted, and he's glorified. So let's go back to the disciples' question. How will we know if we're the last generation of human history? How will we know if we're coming up to the end of human history? And we'll know because God will send us harbingers. What's a harbinger? Harbinger is like an omen, like a forerunner, like a warning. Except in this example, it's not a warning. But last week, or maybe it was a week before, it's starting to run together. But anyway, we had snow in Raleigh. So five inches of snow and ice in my backyard, just solid white. So hard that when you walked on it, it wasn't fluffy. You didn't sink down into it. You walked on top of it. You know? And then it went into deep freeze. It was in the single digits. And I looked out of my window, and I saw at least 100 robins on my white snow. And I had to smile because I thought, you know, it looks like it's dead winter, but spring is coming because robins are a harbinger of spring, okay? And so God sends us harbingers to let us know when the end is near, when we're coming to the end of human history as we know it. And I think that's what Joel chapter 1 is about. And so in Joel chapter 1, the harbingers are credible, and they're clear, and they're compelling. First of all, they're credible. Look at verse 1, just the first phrase. The word of the Lord. These, what we're going to talk about this weekend, the harbingers, they're credible because they're the word of the Lord. It's God's word. God is a gentleman. He doesn't lie. He doesn't mock you and me when we try to seek the truth. He, he, when he speaks, he, he says what he means. He means what he says. Nouns are nouns. Verbs are verbs. You know, you can take him at his word. And this is God's word. So is the prophecy reliable? Is the book of Joel something that we can count on? Absolutely, because it's the word of the Lord. It's God's word. And one of the most meaningful things is in this first verse when it says the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. And Joel Rosenberg has already described Joel the prophet. But let me describe him from my point of view. Joel the prophet is a nobody. You ever feel like a nobody? He's a nobody who became a somebody. You know how? because he received God's word, he took it to his own heart, and then he passed it out to others. Do you want to be a somebody and you're a nobody? Then you read God's word and you apply God's word and you study God's word and you obey God's word and then you share God's word with somebody else and you'll be a somebody in heaven's eyes. So I love the fact that this book is written by a nobody who became a somebody. And Joel Rosenberg, it's going to get confusing, sorry. <laughs> but quoted all the times that Joel the prophet is quoted in the New Testament. Can you imagine this little nobody whose writings were quoted by the apostle Peter on the great day of Pentecost? 
Now that's something. And his words recorded in scripture for all eternity. And so nobodies can become somebodies when they receive the word of God and they internalize it and they live it out and then they share it with others. And I'm assuming that Joel the prophet gave his message out verbally because they couldn't text, they couldn't email, they couldn't print books, you know. So I'm, I'm assuming he went around preaching this word. But then God said, Joel, I want you to write it down. Why? Because he wanted Joel's message, I believe, for you and me today. And Joel Rosenberg was saying that we don't know anything about Joel, the prophet. We don't know if he came before captivity or after captivity. We don't know if he was a prophet to the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. So, we don't, so you know why, I think? Because God wants us to know that his message transcends all that. Don't lock him just in the context of one particular era because I believe his message is for those of us living at the end of human history. And I believe that's why God would put this on my heart and Joel Rosenberg's heart and I pray on your heart to get the message out. This is a message for us at the end of human history. And so the harbingers are undisputable because they are God's words. In verse 2 it says, hear this, hear the word of the Lord. And I have to give a shout out to the Cove because of their ministry, getting people's attention to the word of God. So Michelle, all the things that your team does and you're behind the scenes, but you are helping people hear the word of the Lord. There's nothing you can do more important at the end of human history than get people to hear the word of the Lord. So I'm so grateful that you would come to the Cove, that you would make the time to hear the word of the Lord, but who are you helping to hear the word of the Lord? So at the end of human history, you can't do anything more important then hear it yourself and get other people into your Bible studies, bring them to church, invite them to the Cove, take audios of this weekend and pass them out, get people into God's Word. Great example of that is Noah living at the end of human history as he knew it and listening to the Word of God, the only person in the whole world <laughs> who was listening to God. And God said, Noah, I'm going to send a flood. I'm going to bring judgment. It's the day of the Lord for that particular time. I'm going to destroy the whole world. But I want you to offer salvation to your generation. I want you to build me an ark. And Noah did. Aren't we glad he listened to the word of the Lord? Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Read it. Study it. Apply it. Live by it. Share it with others. Become a somebody in heaven's eyes. Get other people into God's word that they might know what God is saying in these last days. We can't do anything more important than listen to what God says. And one of the things that Joel the prophet gets across is that he looked at things that were happening in his world, and then he overlaid those current events with God's word. And that made sense. And Joel Rosenberg and I were just having a quick conversation because I remember reading something that you wrote somewhere. But he told me that he was converted at the age of eight. But in college, he began to realize that his worldview, his faith, need to impact his worldview. So you need to look at the world situation and however you look at it, but take the scripture and you look at the world through the lens of scripture. It makes all the difference in the world. And so Joel the prophet is doing that. He's looking at what's happening in his world and he's overlaying God's word on it. And that's where he's at, whoa, this is serious. So harbingers are credible because they're undisputable. They're God's word, they're universal. And we're going to look at the harbingers in a moment, but look at this. In verse 2, they're universal because they're for everybody. Twice it says that they're for all who live in the land. And specifically, maybe this is to Israel, but I'm going to apply this to all of those of us here, all of us who live in America in particular. And I've, that's heavy on my heart. And I, I feel this, you know, technically the message could be for Israel. And I hope it gets through to Israel, but I believe God has a message, a prophetic message for the United States of America in the book of Joel. And it's for everybody. Verse 2, it's for the elders, the old people who have gray hair like me. 
Verse three, for children and grandchildren, the young people, the millennials, the generation X's and Y's, and I don't even know how they label them all now, the ones you know who have pierced tongues and pierced noses and purple hair and have iPods and iPads and wear hoodies and tattoos, and it's for them, all right? Verse five, the drunkards. And to me, those are just people who sin openly. You know, they're drunk, they don't even know they're drunk, they're staggering down the road, and it's people who just sin, and they flaunt it, and they march to insist on their rights to it, and they're just wicked, and they don't care who knows it, and they just enjoy their sin, and they're just dragging other people into it. It's for them. It's for the priests. Verse 9, 13, these are the people who are all buttoned up, you know, Religious people keep traditions and rituals and they think they're right with God because they do all the stuff and they're self-deceived, thinking they're, you know, okay because they keep all the rules. It's for them. Verse 11, it's for the farmers, the working people. Verse 14 repeats, it's for all who live in the land. It's for everybody. Specifically, it's for you and it's for me. It's for God's people who are called by God's name, who need to humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. And if they don't, that's the warning. So who will be caught by surprise by the end of human history? Don't let it be you. Jesus said, don't let it catch you like a thief. You and I need to wake up, pay attention to what's happening. The warnings are undisputable, universal, and they're unique. In verse 2, he says, nothing like this has ever happened before. Actually, he put it in the form of a question, but he was meaning nothing like this has ever happened before. That these things are unique to this generation. And he's talking about a locust plague. But I, I want to think, what is unique to my generation? What in my lifetime has never happened before? Something I would tell my children and my grandchildren, and you know, I think there are things like technology, you can now wear your computer on your wrist, <laughs> and just think of computers and the changes in that, or the cell phones, or the communication, the World Wide Web. You think of weapons of war and mass destruction, the nuclear bomb and smart bombs, and Think of medicine and the cloning. I pray not of human beings, but cloning of animals and other things they're doing just in my, and, and travel that we've walked on the moon in my generation. Seems like lifetimes ago, doesn't it? But just in this, gen what is unique to this generation? And then we can talk about disasters, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But Hurricane Katrina wiped out an American city, 9-11, changed us forever as a nation. So many other things we're going to talk about in a few moments, but the warnings are unique. They're something that's happening in this generation that hasn't happened before. So listen to me, stop pretending. Stop thinking that, you know, we're just going through a cycle and now it swings this way and then it swings that way and we're going to come back somewhere in the middle. And I believe with all my heart, with deep conviction, we're living at the end of human history as we know it. So, wake up. The harbingers are credible because it's God's word to you and me through a nobody who became a somebody for this generation, I believe. And the harbingers are clear. I believe this is the end, and we know because God sends these harbingers, and I've put them in categories, just makes it easier for me, but they're disasters. And you know, um, in the Old Testament, when God couldn't get the attention of his people, and he couldn't get them to listen to his prophets or listen to his word, then he would send a disaster, like a locust plague, like an invading army, to wake them up, to get their attention. And I believe that's what he's doing in our world today. And so Joel says these harbingers will come as a series of disasters, and it doesn't, they're not sequential. They can all happen at the same time, which is what I think is happening, which makes them so incredibly unsettling and maybe unique to this generation. But the first one, environmental disasters, and that is the locust plague in verse 4. 
and the locust plague just came in. The locust came in and ate everything progressively, you know, through all the stages of the locust, until nothing was left. And it was an environmental disaster. So what record-breaking, and Joel says, nothing like this has ever happened before. So what record-breaking environmental disaster can you think of? And I'll just go back the last two years, okay? And you can go back if you want for a generation, but we don't have time. So I went back to 2013. Hurricane Sandy was called the Frankenstorm. $65 billion it cost destroyed the coastlines of New York and New Jersey. Moore, Oklahoma saw a tornado that was a Category 5 with winds of 200 miles an hour. In Yosemite, there was a rim fire that burned for 10 weeks. It was the largest Sierra blaze in history. Colorado flooded in 17 counties, and those are just a few. We'll go over some more on Sunday. 2014, that was the hottest year on record and the coldest winter on record. Isn't that interesting? And there was, the, the winter was 35 degrees below average for two-thirds of the nation. The drought in California went into its third year. There was an earthquake in Napa Valley that cost $2 billion. The snow in Buffalo went to seven feet. And then we have 2015. Very young, but... Denver had a snow in February that broke a record that had been held for 103 years. Boston broke their all-time record. And I know in North Carolina, we've broken already records for cold. And that's, that's just in 2015. And so increasingly, we're seeing things ratchet up, aren't we? So it's just the environmental disasters are getting worse and worse and worse. And don't pretend that they're not. And you know that because of the record-breaking, record-breaking, record-breaking. And something maybe broke a 100-year record, and then it's a 10-year record, and then it broke last year, and then they're just breaking records every year, and they're just shattering the record books. Harbingers, warnings. So don't dismiss God's warnings because they come through the environment. And people say it's global warming, it's the polar vortex, it's El Nino, or, you know... Joel, the prophet, would tell you that behind those environmental disasters is God who's trying to get our attention. And social disasters. Verse 5, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. And substance abuse, drugs, alcoholism is at an epidemic in the United States. Alcohol-related accidents are the leading cause of death in young people. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I did research on this. We spend more money on alcohol than we spend on cancer. Number one drug problem in America. And it's directly related, involved in 73% of felonies, 73% of child beatings, 41% of rapes, 81% of wife battering, 72% of stabbings, 83% of homicides. That's a disaster. And drug abuse whether it's, you know, prescription drugs or heroin or cocaine. The latest one that seems to be sort of, you know, not so bad is marijuana. Marijuana has been legalized for entertainment or for recreational use in four states. 23 states recognize it for medicinal purposes. Two-thirds of high school seniors say that it's not bad for you. It's okay to smoke marijuana. If you smoke it on a regular basis, it's been proven to lower your grades, you're less likely to graduate, you have depression, you have a lower income, you're more likely to be unemployed, and regular use leads to a drop of eight points in your IQ. That's a disaster. Active shooters, you know, people that just go out and shoot people, like Sandy Hook, Fort Hood, Kansas City Rest Home, Virginia Tech, the Washington Navy Yard, who would ever forget Columbine? In 2000 to 2006, there were six per year. Now there's one every three weeks. That's a disaster. The racial tension in Ferguson over a police officer who apparently was doing his job and the whole country riots. Until yesterday, somebody pulls out a gun and shoots two policemen just standing outside their precinct. That's a disaster. 
and the University of Oklahoma at Norman in that fraternity, and I saw a video of that. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe they did it, much less videoed themselves doing it and posting it. And I don't even know how to describe that. So I, I want. It was just disgusting. It was a rap that was a racial rap. It was absolutely disgusting. And that's a disaster. That's on our college campus. Some parents are paying for their kids to go to school and go to that fraternity, and oh my goodness! So, wake up! It's a harbinger. The social disasters, the environmental disasters, financial disaster. Verse five: Wine will be snatched from your lips. And in Joel's day, wine wasn't a luxury; it was a staple. So what he's saying is, things that you need, your everyday necessities, in one moment are going to be taken from you. And we might not understand that until the last few years, when we've had major institutions collapse, major banks that collapse, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and all of that. And just like that, people lost their pensions, their 401ks, their retirements, and it's going to be worldwide. And I believe it's going to be worse. It's that's just those were harbingers of how bad it's going to get. So Revelation 6 says that at the end, it will take a year's wage to buy a loaf of bread. So what financial disaster do you see on the horizon? I googled that, and I'm getting some of my research from the internet. And I do try to go to reputable web websites. And Wall Street Journal said that they're predicting a financial crash in 2015. And Donald Trump, and I don't know what you think about him. He's sort of all over the place, isn't he? But he seems to understand money, and he said that he believes Americans need to get ready for financial ruin, financial disaster. That's a harbinger. I actually think financial prosperity, when the stock market goes so far up and the rich become so rich and the poor get poor and there's no jobs in the middle class, I think that is a disaster. I think that's a harbinger. I remember hearing David Wilkerson preach on that, and it was a warning. Prosperity is not necessarily a blessing from God. National disaster. In verses six and seven, a nation has invaded, and he's referring to the locusts coming in. But then I got to thinking that he was saying that the locusts were like a nation invading his land, and so it was a, an invasion of a non-human army. So then I thought, well, what is a non-human army that's invading America right now? What's an inhuman army that's invading our nation? Pornography, just. And Fifty Shades of Grey. If you have read that book, if you've gone to see that movie, I hope your face is Fifty Shades of Red. Don't go near it. <laughs> it glamorizes. It makes entertainment, sexual violence, and abuse of women. Where are the women's rights? Where are the women's lip people? Where are the feminists to rise up and say, "Don't do that"? It's pornography. And every time I turn, you know, my my website, my home page when I go online is a news service, and on the news service with all the news items are little thumbnail things of pictures that I think if I was a young person, I wonder if I would click. And they just suck you into pictures that, in my mind, used to be in Playboy and some of those other dirty magazines that were behind the counter, and and now they're right there on the home page of a news service. And you know why? Because pornography is big business. Did you know that pornography makes more in one year than Microsoft, Apple, Google, eBay, Amazon, and there's one more. All of them put together. Yahoo, <laughs> Apple, Google, Yahoo, eBay, Microsoft, Amazon, all of them combined. And it's come. It's just like a seeping poison, isn't it? And it's not just ruining the young people. And I'm here to tell you. I don't want to digress from the message, but if there's somebody here that's involved in that, listen to me. You bring it to the cross. Bring it to the cross and nail it there. You crucify that. You think it's just harmless. You think you can get power. That you think it doesn't. It's destroying your spirit. 
and it has repercussions for eternity. Stop it. That's a disaster, national disaster. I think the worst invading non-human army is unbelief. Secularism, humanism, agnosticism, atheism that's just crept into the United States of America, one nation under God, in God we trust. And when our president quotes the Pledge of Allegiance, he leaves out under God. That's a national disaster. And there might be others you can think of. Spiritual disaster. In verse 9, the grain offering and drink offering are cut off, which meant that the sacrifices ceased because there was nothing to sacrifice. So the priests mourned. And when they could no longer sacrifice, they couldn't go to the temple, they couldn't worship, they had no ceremony, sacrifices, and they felt cut off from God. They felt God had abandoned them. And when disasters strike, isn't that one of the first reactions of people? God, where are you? I remember right after 9-11, and CBS Morning News called and asked for an interview, and so I talked with Jane Clayson, and that's the question she asked me. Anne, where was God on 9-11? <laughs> and I said, Jane, we've been telling God for years to get out. You know, get out of our business, get out of our government, get out of our schools, get out of our marketplace. And God, who is a gentleman, he doesn't force himself on us. He backs off with tears streaming down his face, if I can describe him that way, but weeping, and he just removes his hand from our lives and he allows us to be subjected to those things that otherwise he would have protected us from, removes his, that's the judgment of Romans 1. It's not fire and brimstone coming from heaven. It's just God backs away. And we can feel it. And if people would say, oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh, God, we run to you. We cling to you. We repent of our sin. We want you back into our national life. We want you back into our schools. We want you back into our businesses. God, please forgive us. Come back. We can't live without you. We can't function without you. We can't handle ISIS without you. Please come back. God would come back. You draw near to him. He will draw near to you. But you know what we do? We say, well, where was God on 9-11? So he didn't show up. So you know what? God doesn't care about me then. I'm not going to care about him. And that's a spiritual disaster. And it leads to all this atheism, agnosticism, humanism, secret people looking for answers somewhere else. And a lot of it's just that pride and rebellion of the human spirit. Anyway, they don't want to come under his authority. That's a spiritual disaster. And it leads to an emotional disaster. Verse 8, mourn like a virgin, grieving for her husband. You know what that would be? That would be inconsolable grief. And verse 12, the joy of the people is withered away. And I thought about that. You know, we've just seen the one-year mark of the disappearance of the Malaysian Flight 370. And all those people disappeared, and so they showed the families this year. One year later, still grieving. They have no closure. They're inconsolable in their grief. And I think, what if it was a whole nation that was inconsolable in their grief? And listen to me. That flight, 370, was a Boeing 777. That was a harbinger. And God was warning the world. There's coming a day when you're going to see not 200 and whatever people disappear. You're going to see millions of people disappear. And they're going to be your family members and your friends and your neighbors and your spouses and your parents and your children. And just like that, in a twinkling of an eye, they're going to be caught up to be with the Lord and America will collapse. Think about it. That will be judgment for America. And there are other parts of the world that will collapse Africa, South America, Asia. Joel Rosenberg pointed out to me, I think it was the first time we had a conversation, Europe would be untouched, just about. Isn't that interesting? And Israel. So, but 
we can feel already the agitation of spirit, can we? And the oppression. I do. But for a person who doesn't know Jesus, doesn't have the assurance that if somebody took off their head, they're going to instantly be with Jesus, with their Heavenly Father. If they're looking for satisfaction and fulfillment and meaning in the possession of their things, their position, their power, their prestige, their reputation, their food, their drink, where they travel, and, and when it's cut off and it's snatched away, the joy will be withered and they'll grieve like a bride for her bridegroom. Agricultural disaster. Verse 10, the fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, despair you farmers. We've all seen pictures of fields that look like sun-baked clods and, or fields that are underwater, orchards that are frozen. I heard somewhere recently, and I didn't see the item twice, so either it snatched away or it wasn't true, but anyway, that mad cow disease is somewhere in the United States. And all it takes is something like that sweeping through our herds or something going through our flocks and I mean, America... It's unthinkable, but that we could experience famine. Agricultural disaster. So environmental, financial, national, religious, emotional, agricultural harbingers. And Joel is saying that God is behind these disasters. That they didn't just happen. It's not just a freak of nature. It's not just the polar vortex. It's God is trying to wake us up, to get our attention. So we need to... Stop pretending and look up. Give him our attention. The warnings are credible because it's God's word. They're clear. Harbinger after harbinger after harbinger. And I think they're very compelling. God is merciful. Yes, he is. And God is loving. Yes, he is. <laughs> and God is gracious. Yes, he is. And God is kind. Yes, he is. And God is merciful. Yes, he is. But God is also just. And he's holy. And he's righteous. And there's coming a point that he says, my patience has run out. Genesis 6, he says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And God's spirit strives with man by restraining evil so life can go on. But there's coming a time when he says, I'm not going to do that anymore. You've told me to get out. I'm backing away. I'll no longer strive. I'll no longer restrain the evil. And that's when you have catastrophe. That's when you have calamity. That's when you have everything falling apart. And verse 16 says, it's done right before our very eyes. But I want to tell you something, that the harbingers, warnings convey hope. Think about it. Why, why couldn't God just, you know, just do it? <laughs> just destroy us. Just judge us. He warns us. Why? Because he's wanting us to repent. There's still time to turn this thing around. God would be relieved if he didn't have to bring judgment. And so when he warns us, it's always because there's time to cry out to him that he might stay his hand of judgment. And so I believe these warnings, the harbingers, compel us to cry out, first of all, with necessity or humility. Verse 13, dress in sackcloth. Sackcloth is just outwardly dressing in such a way that you're showing inwardly you're desperate for God. Oh God, if you don't get us out of this mess, we're not going to get out. If you don't heal our land, we're not going to be healed. If you don't solve the problem with ISIS, if you can call that a problem, it's not going to be solved. If you don't bring the races together, they're not going to come together. USA Today had a whole thing about how you can heal Ferguson, and they're talking about this, and this psychiatrist, and this talking about that. You know they just need Jesus, they need the cross, they need the gospel, and it's the last thing they'll bring in. Oh, God, we're desperate. I think that's why we haven't had revival. We're not desperate enough. What's it going to take? I remember Henry Blackaby saying, if 9-11 doesn't wake you up and make you desperate, what will it take? So we cry out with humility, necessity. We cry out with sincerity. Verse 14, you fast. 
church programs, seminars like this, conferences, National Day of Prayer, they're important, but they're no substitute for praying ourselves, turning away from everything in order to turn to God in prayer. If prayer is turning to God, fasting is turning away from everything so you can do that. When do you fast? What is fasting? Fasting is going without anything and everything so you can make the time to get alone with God and pray. You go without food, go without eating, exercising, talking, telephoning, emailing, business, ministry, housework, you name it, you stop it, and you get along with God, and you pray. Have you ever fasted? And I understand if you can't fast from food, all right? I have a husband who can't fast from food. I have a daughter who can't fast from food. So there's some of us that can't fast from food. But you can fast from everything else and make time to get alone. With God. We'll talk about that later this weekend, but there's no substitute for time spent alone with God, not if you want to receive his word, have it internalized. And when he brings it into your heart, there's comfort, peace, clarity, wisdom, discernment. You know what to do, and then you give it out to others, and you see lives changed, and you're making a difference at the end of human history. That's a privilege. So you cry out with sincerity. You fast. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, when you fast. It's not an option. And we cry out with urgency. The day of the Lord, verse 15, the day of the Lord is near. And Joel Rosenberg has defined the day of the Lord. I would just describe it as a day of reckoning and accountability. It's a day when God's patience runs out. And Joel the prophet was saying it was near because I'm assuming he was pointing towards a Babylonian invasion that would take away Judah or the Assyrian invasion that would take away the northern kingdom of Israel. So the day of the Lord was, in one sense, fulfilled in that, in that way. And I know the greater, the ultimate fulfillment is going to be at the end of the tribulation period, as Joel Rosenberg described. But I also believe that maybe if we don't turn to God, he would allow judgment to fall on America? Is the day of the Lord a time of his judgment coming on our nation because of the way we keep shaking our little dust fists in his face? So we cry out with urgency. And Joel says the day of the Lord is near, it's coming, and it's going to be ugly. And so in verse 19, this is the culmination of chapter 1, he says, verse 19, to you, O Lord, I call. And he turns to him in prayer. And you know, I looked through this chapter. <laughs> it doesn't tell us how to pray. It doesn't even say, Lord, forgive us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you know. It just says, to you, O Lord, I call. So I'm going to insert my own words. It's just, help. God, have mercy. We call on you. Let's be clear about who we're calling on. We're calling on the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're calling on the same God that the children of Israel called on when they were down in Egypt and they were oppressed by the bondage of the Egyptians and they cried out to God and God heard their cry and he sent them Moses to deliver them. And then they were there pinned with the Red Sea on one side and mountains on this side and the desert on that side. And here comes Pharaoh's army and they cried out to God and he opened up the Red Sea and they passed through on dry ground and he collapsed it on Pharaoh's army and God heard their cry. And we come to Joshua and he's led the children of Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land and there's Jericho straddling his path and so he leads the children of Israel around Jericho every day, every day, every, for seven days. The seventh day, they go around it seven times. On the seventh time, they blow their trumpets and they cry out and the walls come down. And they take the enemy's stronghold. Gideon, down in the wine press, so scared of the Midianites, he's terrified. And God said, Gideon, I want you to take these 300 men. You take jars, you put torches inside, you stand on the rims of the mountains around the Midianites, and at midnight you break the jars and you hold up the, and you cry out. And when they did, the Midianites fled. And David, 
facing the enemy giant Goliath. And it wasn't exactly a cry, but it was a battle cry, wasn't it? When little David ran out there and he said, You come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God of Israel. And he takes out his little slingshot and he fells the giant. Elijah cried out on Mount Carmel and the fire fell. And he cried out again and the rains came and ended the three-year drought. And Jonah... Sorry, I think he's sort of a miserable prophet, but <laughs> I can't think of a worse place to be than in the belly of a fish in the bottom of the ocean. But he cried out, and God heard his cry and delivered him. And the Apostle Paul in the Philippian jail at midnight, he didn't just cry out, he sang out. <laughs> and an earthquake came, and his chains fell off, and God delivered him. And there I mention in that category, not in the same level, but our Lord Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross, crying out in a loud voice, it is finished! Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he didn't just die because somebody took his life, he gave his life, he refused to take the next breath, he gave his life, he put his spirit in his father's hands. Three days later, his father raised him from the dead. Oh, listen to me, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You cry out to him, and he hears your cry. Joel Rosenberg's mentor, Dr. Koshi, had a phrase I have used and just loved that our God is a prayer-hearing, prayer-answering, miracle-working God. Cry out to Him. He waits for us to cry out to Him. Remember the disciples on the sea. And the storm came, and He went as though to pass by. Have you ever wondered about that? He was waiting for them to cry out, and as soon as they did, he was in the boat with them, and the sea was calm. He's waiting for his people to cry out. He's the God of creation, the God of redemption, the God of salvation. He's the God of justice and mercy, forgiveness and grace, blessing upon blessing upon blessing, but he's waiting for you and me to cry out to him. Psalm 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. God will deliver you. And I just wonder before I conclude, is there somebody here, you're in a day of the Lord. Have you had problem after problem after problem in your finances, in your health, in your family, in your business? Is God trying to get your attention? Has he brought you here for that purpose? cry out to him go back to your room tonight get on your knees cry out to him I'm not going to tell you how we're not told how in this verse just God help me I'm in a mess help me and he may not help you just like that but you've taken the first step to deliverance you'll never know if he'll deliver you until you cry out so cry out verse 19 do you O Lord I call Fire has devoured the open passage, pastures. Verse 20, fire has devoured the open pastures. And I read that and I thought I'd misread it. So I went back and he's, he's repeating himself. So is he just beginning to, you know, stutter? And I think, no, you know what? Until we cry out, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. So nothing is going to solve this except... The answer is not in politics, it's not in Washington, it's not in finances, it's not in education, it's not in treaties that come and go. The answer is in God's people who are called by God's name, humbling themselves, praying, seeking his face, and crying out to him. So that's my challenge tonight. Would you cry out on behalf of our nation? Would you cry out on behalf of the United States of America? It's time to wake up. God has sent us harbingers for that purpose. And the harbingers are credible because it's God's word. And they're clear, one after another, disaster after disaster. And they're compelling. They compel us to cry out to God. Would you do that? Pray with me, please.
and just in the quietness, I'm going to ask you to just personally tell God right now that you're going to cry out to him, that tonight, before you put your head on the pillow, you'll slip down on your knees. How long has it been since you prayed on your knees? Kneel down and tell him you want to cry out. The disasters, it's funny how the news can make it seem like, you know, this is bad today, but it'll be better tomorrow, and we'll have a better year next year, and finances come and go, and we're in this cycle in the stock market, and whatever, whatever. And you're telling us, you are telling us, this is unique. And this is a message that's universal and it's undisputable. You are speaking to us, telling us we are at the end and it's time to wake up and cry out. So, Lord, tonight we make that commitment. We will cry out to you on behalf of our nation. We ask that you hear our cry. And, Lord, I pray for the ones in this room for whom this is very personal because they're experiencing a day of the Lord. Oh Lord, thank you that you brought them to the cove. Thank you that with the disasters and the problems, you're trying to get their attention, but there's hope in that. You're, you're paying attention because you want them to see you in a fresh way. You want to adjust something. You want to speak to them. You want to deepen them. You want to strengthen their faith. Don't let us get impatient for answers or deliverance, Lord. We'll take it in your time. But we believe when we cry out to you that our God is a prayer-hearing, prayer-answering, miracle-working God, the same God of Moses and Elijah and David and Jonah and Paul is our God. So hear our prayer, we ask in Jesus' name.